What's going on, everybody? This recording is in progress. As you know, we record everything here, so don't worry. Uh, but this is live. This is live on LinkedIn. This is live on YouTube. Welcome, everybody, to the very first episode of Surviving Sales. The purpose of this show is to highlight salespeople. Let me know where you're tuning in from in the chat. Change your chat settings to everyone. Shout out, Dan, first in the chat. We appreciate you, pal. Uh, Stanford, Connecticut. Yeah, we know. We know. Excited for this. Shout out, Kelly. What's popping? Boston in the house. Let me know where you're coming in from. Awesome stuff. This is a Sell Better production brought to you, as always, by JB Sales. I'm excited to have my very own show, Surviving Sales. It's going to air once a week, and we'll highlight salespeople and their skills all over the world. Today, I am joined by Bob Rollins, a.k.a. a sales guy, Bob. Bob cut his teeth in the Coast Guard and did some pretty amazing things that I'll let him tell you about and fixed broken companies for a long time. Uh, but then he found his passion. And like many of us, Bob got hooked on the big commission checks that are associated with high performance salespeople. And he never looked back. So he's done his time in the trenches, paid his dues, and he's rose to where he is now doing the, the thing that he likes best. And I'm going to let him tell you what that's about. But first, let me get my let me get my, get my screen going. So check this out, y'all. Y'all going to love these images right here. Shout out to my team. Look at this. Bam. Surviving sales featuring Bob Rollins. We got to have, have a sales guy, Bob, right there. Again, this is going to air weekly. I'm really excited for this to be the thing, right? Uh, so, so this is a long time coming for me. I've been thinking about this for a very long time. I want to give a shout out to our partners, the people that make things like this possible with us. Proposify, Reprise, Chili Piper, Dooley, Sales Loft, Vidyard, Ambition, and Zoom Info. These are all people that make things like this possible. We're fortunate to work with these names because they make it possible for you guys to learn in situations just like this. So be sure to take a look at these companies and see how they can help you book more meetings, close more deals, and grow your company. That's it. That's it for me. It's only two minutes. Bob, I'm going to hand it to you. How did you get from Coast Guard to this? Oh, man, you make me sound so much bigger than I am. <laughs> so, you know, 91, I got out of the Coast Guard. I had done that right out of high school. Ended up getting one of those conversations with the government guy that said, look, you can either stay in or you can come out and come work for me. And, I, you know, I went and joined the government after that. Did a lot of things that, uh, let's just say, don't exist. And I never did. Got out of that um, after a good number of years and got into sales. Mm. So straight from the government into sales, startup companies. I worked for probably three or four different startup companies, found out very quickly we were the greatest thing nobody ever heard about and was a part of a lot of failing startup companies. What that caused me to do is go, wait a minute, you've got some great technologies here. You've got great, amazing stuff, but you're dying every time because nobody knows who you are. That led me into 12 years of international business consultant where I would travel the world and go fix broken companies. So I would primarily come in. I did it in, in Argentina for six months. I lived in South Africa. I would go in and sit down and look at the books, look at the organization, and primarily from a sales aspect, go in and fix everything. So it's so from I, an analytical perspective. You're coming in, looking at yes. everything and saying, here's where the gaps are. This is where we can improve. Yes, because you, you had a lot of companies that back then, you could have the greatest month or the greatest year in sales ever and be losing money. Because your cost of goods or your commission checks or whatever it may be was out of whack. And I figured out if I put everything, let's say I take four years of financials, I put it down into percentages. My percentages don't lie. It doesn't matter what you make in revenue. If your percentages are in line, you're making money. So I figured that out. So for 12 years, there wasn't a single event I ever went into that I didn't at the end of the day hold every sales record the company had before I left. Now I get bored stupid when things are up and running and it's a desk job, that just doesn't make me happy. So I kept bouncing around and doing that. Then fast forward to 08 and the recession and everything crashes. Yeah, the real right. estate bomb and all that. Everything blew up. At that point, you had no company in the world that number one had the money to go pay anybody, much less wanted to pay some guy to tell them how broken they were. <laughs> so I did e everything from roofing to working in greenhouses. It didn't matter what it was. Well, like we were saying earlier before, even though you were doing that well, you'd go and you'd get a contract and they'd pay you and you give them advice and then they wouldn't take it anyway. So you wonder why they're even 
It, yeah, I mean, it's it's the craziest thing when people will pay you good money, really good money, and then not listen to you. It's insane. <laughs> I, I think I hear that from a lot of consultants. You know, that, that's a very common, it's a common sob story, right? But I suppose champagne problems, right? You got paid, right. you gave your that's advice, that. they chose not to do it, right? But that landed me in recruiting. Okay. And, and that's where you really found your heart, right? That's where I found it because I literally could take my sales background. And I, I truly believe you, you have two different classes of salespeople. Number one, you were either born that way and you just have a God given gift for sales, or you can be trained to be a salesperson. Mm, okay. Two different people. Do you, feel, do you feel like one performs over the other in your experience? I, I do because one is natural. Okay. One, one, there's less effort has to be made. Yes. One, it's work. One is, it's just there. Yeah. And you don't even have to think about it. You just know it. Yeah. Yeah. I know so, a few people like that. Shout out, shout out the people in the chat that you know that are that way. <laughs> there you go. So that landed me in recruiting, but from a sales aspect primarily. And, you know, I truly believe, you know, recruiting and hiring is one of those elements of business that every business has. But for history, HR has been its own little beast. Mm. And you hire people that are HR people. Well, how is an HR person ever supposed to hire a salesperson? Because they've, they've never, never been one. Sales. They've never done anything in sales. And I'm sorry, but salespeople are the best con people in the world. Hey, so, now there's a, there's a good one for the chat. Uh, how do you guys feel about that, right? I think there's merit there. Salespeople do sell themselves really well. Exactly. So if you've got an HR person that's being sold by sales, they're going to get overrun all day, every day. So I found a really good niche takes one to no one. Right. So it was great. I absolutely loved it. Things went well, things went great. I love, like you mentioned that really big commission check where you're getting, you know, 20, $30,000 on a pop. Those right. Are right. But I got into executive search and executive consulting from that because primarily, you know, that's a very dog eat dog world, competitive. It's very difficult. It and I found out that executives, C-suite executives primarily, they don't ever get any help. They get no love in, in recruiting. Nobody ever helps them. And honestly, they're just as in need of help as anybody else. Yeah. So I spent you know six or seven years helping C-suite executives learn how to interview, learn how to build a, a LinkedIn profile, do all of those things that they need in order to go get their jobs. Well, COVID hits, everything goes wonky. Everybody knows the story of all of that happy stuff. Fast forward all the way to this year. Got reached out to by a company called OpenX, where I am now the head of talent at OpenX. Hey, Open what does OpenX do? Is literally rapid workforce development, we have a goal of going out there and fixing the skills gap in workforce. Okay. So from an engineering manufacturing side of the house, here's one of the kickers. We not only guarantee placements like every other company in the world, but we have a skills guarantee on every placement by one of our partner companies. So obviously we can have long conversations about that. Anybody interested in that, obviously reach out to me. I don't. Yeah, Bob, Bob's a guy that'll reach back out. He's super responsive. I tell you what, I oh, reached absolutely. out to Bob. He immediately hit me back like, hey, what's up, man? What can I do for you? A responsiveness is such a big part of it. And I think mindset plays a role too. So tell me this. I know that mindset plays a role in the longevity of salespeople. Um, yes. What's the mindset that you've developed over the years in sales that fed really nicely into recruiting? The, the biggest thing is conversation. Yeah. So you've got to listen. I mean, I, I always taught my salespeople and like I've run, you know, 80 person call centers. I've run started. I've run everything there is in sales, every element. I've been a door knocker myself. It is all about listening. I tell everybody the number one rule in sales is shut up. <laughs> it's <And> counterintuitive, right? <laughs> it is because you have your pitch and you want to go out and do your pitch and you want to get your point across 
but you forget to listen. And everything is conversational. Everything, you know, I don't want to say is helping someone, but you've got to listen in order to be able to sell or to help someone. So now you worked the in the you worked in the manufacturing and aerospace industry. I'm going yes. to go ahead and assume, or I'm sorry, not manufacturing, um, aerospace and defense. defense. Yes, I'm I'm going to imagine that those people are are pretty cagey. <laughs> well, it, it's it's not as much that. Look, I, I I got out of the Coast Guard and went to work for the government. Obviously, aerospace and defense. I have dabbled in that. I have played with that throughout my entire career. Now. OpenX is a big supporter of yeah, aerospace yeah. and defense. Yeah. You know, we, we are SBI, our contractor. We've got all kinds of things going there. But bottom line is they're just like anybody else in running a business as well. They just stay on government contracts. Anytime you work with the government, that is a completely different animal. So it's a very interesting world where you've got a lot of ex-military, you've got current military, and then you've got the government red tape on top of everything. So on top of everything, there's a ton of rules and regulations mm. on how you can and cannot sell and buy and do things. Yeah. Would you say would would you say there's something specific that stands out in a government situation or a military contract that you would never see outside of that? Is there is there something that stands out to you there? Time. <laughs> more more time than anything, right? Look, it, it's one of those things where you have a sense of urgency in most businesses. You know you need to do, like hiring somebody. Okay, I've got an open seat. That open seat is costing me money because I don't have anybody in it. Mm. I don't care if it's a salesperson, it's a manufacturing person, or it's a C-suite. It is costing you money not to have somebody in that seat. The government is different. I don't want to say the government doesn't really care about profit and loss but they don't have the same urgency as a business does. Mm. And heaven help you when you get to October and the end of budget, you know, the government is very big for, if you don't have all of your money spent, you don't get it next year. So you'll see September, October, a whole lot of spending on the government side. Yes, yeah, they use it or lose it, right? Exactly. <laughs> do you do you do you go into those conversations knowing and being very transparent, knowing that their use it or lose it situation will kick in? I imagine that to be a call oh, in January. That's like, oh no, we haven't decided. And you're like, that's all right, I'll call you when you're ready to spend it, right? <laughs> it, it it is very much like that. It it's the budgetary concerns and stuff, and then you have your contractors. You have your prime contractors and your secondary contractors. You know, I worked for a company out of D.C. that ended up being being bought out by Boeing. But at the time, back in the day, we were a subcontractor to most of the major primes. Mm. And it's interesting where we had guys in in our business development side of the house that would go out and sit on contracts for every prime contractor. So I don't care who won the contract from the government. We were on it. Yeah, I didn't have to compete to be a prime contractor. Government contracting and government sales is its own beast in and of itself. It is completely different than any other sale you are ever, ever do in your life. Yeah, it's got to be. There's just too many stakeholders. We could harp on that for a really long time, but I want to oh, yeah, move. We, we Yeah, we definitely could. If you've done government sales, let us know in the chat that that's something you have experience with and you know that length of time. That's a good that's a good empathy question there. Yeah, uh, so, so listen, in SaaS, we know that, and when I say SaaS, I'm referring to the SaaS industry overall, uh, software yeah. as a service. What we know is that we have specific rituals that we go through when we're doing research for prospects and you know, preparing for outreach and calls. What, what is the difference in, in that when it comes to the recruiting side? It, there is no difference. It, it's the same research. So most people, most companies will have you know, an open seat. They've got a JD or a job description for it. And that thing goes for years and years and years, the exact same JD. What I do when we go in and we land a, a partner and we call them partners, not clients or customers, because it truly is a partnership to know and understand the needs of that company, the needs of that position in order to go best fulfill it. So why do you have the opening? What does this person need to be able to do? What is the critical element? I always say, tell me the number one thing this person has to do, but also the flip side. 
tell me the number one thing never to bring you with a candidate. Mm. It, it helps me set up and understand the, the, I hate culture, I hate that word, but what is needed or required to make that person work out well. Yeah. So we really do a needs analysis on every opening our partner companies have from going through the job description and going, okay, don't just give me a canned job description. Tell me what you need this person to do. What is their but, role responsibilities? What are their skills? You, know, you go good. ask anybody in recruiting and hiring today, what is your number one problem with hiring? I it seems like a good line of questioning to get to sooner, right? Like don't try to build to it, get to it fast and, and get that part out of the way, right? Yeah, first conversation, sure. You've got to have that because number one, from, from me as a partner, I need to know if you're open and willing to work with me. Hmm. You know, if, if, you, if you've got a wall up, this is what I want, this is how I want it, then it might not be the best situation because yeah. I need to be able to work with you in order to send you and it's how we are very good at sending three to four candidates total for a hire. You know, we would don't you say them. would you say the recruiting space is particular about who they work with in that regard? If you're not easy to work with, then we're able to say no thank you to that contract, that seat. It's it's difficult because the recruiting space, look, large companies have an HR department. So why are they going to go pay 20%, 30% of a salary? to an outside firm to go what do what they're already paying people to do. Mm. So it's a very competitive market. If they do open the door for that, then you've got all these companies competing against themselves and competing against internal HR. Is LinkedIn yeah. still the first stop for all of this? Is what? Is LinkedIn still the first stop for all of this when you're going out and finding those fits depends after the they job. tell you? It depends on the job. Manufacturing, and hourly rate stuff, absolutely not. Yeah, that is still your indeeds of the world and things like that. Got for those kinds of jobs. Interesting. Yes, you have LinkedIn. You have LinkedIn for your more, you know, call it sixty k <clears throat> and above kind of positions. But your hourly jobs, no, they're not necessarily on LinkedIn. But do you is, find? Is, go ahead. Do you find that there is a personality type that that gravitates towards a specific role? And is it easy to put those together? I think as sellers in the SaaS space, we do a great job identifying people that are going to relate to what we're saying and what we're talking about. I'd imagine that in the recruiting space, it's got to be a similar vibe, right? It's What's your culture seems to kind of come into focus. Well, people have been so trained in job searching. To where you know the job seeker is going to go out there and and buckshot every application that's out there with their resume yeah and then they're going to complain about getting ghosted they're going to complain about the ats or the applicant tracking system shooting them down and yada yada well the other end of the side is the hr people going you know i posted a job up and i got 450 applications within 30 seconds and 90 percent of them are not even qualified for the job so the two fight like this constantly and have created this incredible market of ghosting and distrust and frustration where, okay, if you've got a job, and I had a guy ask me this the other day, and I saw a post on LinkedIn about it, should I update my resume or have a different resume for every application that I do? The answer to me is absolutely yes, because you need to take the time, if that is a job you want, to turn around and say, this is why I'm a good fit for this job. This is what I've done. This is how my background applies. And this is what I can do for you. And not just can your background, because there's no job out there that's a per perfect match for your resume. You've got to tell why. You've got to go in and look at the skills they're looking for and make sure your resume, if you have them, mm. is reflected on your resume. Yeah being lazy and take the time to do things right you only need five or six applications if you do it correctly just like i only need to submit three to four candidates for a hire if i've done my job right i don't ever do more than that you're gonna i guarantee you you will hire one of my candidates of four i send you because i have to know you well enough i have to have that needs analysis done to know what you want. 
Yeah, and we've said before that the trouble you and I, when we when we talked initially, we said the first, the problem with hiring salespeople is that you don't know if they can actually sell until after you hire them. <laughs> that part of it, it's exactly. a conundrum, right? And that's why you said it takes one to know one. You've got to have that if you're going to recruit salespeople. Uh, interesting do do comments that? here from the folks about customizing their resume. Uh, I like that Rachel said she customizes her cover letter, but never the resume. That's interesting. What are your thoughts on that? It's you know, again, I mean, how many people use a resume? How many people are use a cover letter or read a cover letter? Yeah. If you submit an application, it goes into the ATS. The ATS is going to look for keywords. It's going to shoot you down and reject you if you don't have what they're looking for. Hmm. Well, that means that you've got to go through and look at the JD and go, what skill sets are they looking for? Look at the what? What was that? Them. Look at the what? The job description, the JD. Okay, I'm, I, I didn't put that together. As a non-recruiter, I didn't put that together. <laughs> so, the JD is your job description or the posting for the job. And it's going to have certain buzzwords and skill sets in it that are required. Okay, of that, you need to go back in and look at your background and go, how many of these do I have? Well, if I have them, I need to make sure they're in my resume. Because obviously on this side, the ATS is looking for those buzzwords. If you don't take the time to update your resume, then it doesn't have them here. I've heard of this crazy trick, and let me know if you know about this, but I've heard of this crazy trick where people will take a job description and pull out keywords and then put them on their resume in very small font at the bottom, but then put the letters as white or transparent so that those machine learnings pick up those keywords and add them to qualifications in search engines and whatnot. Have you heard of this before? Yes. And I, I've... Does it work? <laughs> It works, but here's the bottom line. You are still going to have eyes on that resume. Mm. When those eyes see that resume and don't see the keywords in bold type in your job description, in what you've done for companies, and they're just highlighted at the bottom in white where you can't see them. Okay, what, what am I going to think as a recruiter when I get that resume? You that don't may see it. Be like, yes but I don't see any of the right. keywords in right. your background. Why did you even apply to this job? Yeah, gonna be, it's going to be a trashed resume right away. It won't make the it cut, is. right? Right. You, uh, you so let me ask you this. And I get that. Let, let me ask you this because I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. In a lot of cases with, with SaaS sales specifically, I know it's a chase game. There's a lot of like chasing people down. I, I don't think that it would function the same way as a recruiter because – and this is just my brain working. If I have to chase them to take the job, the person that I get them the job with is going to have to chase them to do the job. That's so good. how? So how, how? What's the balance there? Is it I'm going to engage heavily, and then if you don't engage back with me, I'm I'm going to just move on to the next candidate. That that depends on the firm and the mentality of recruiting, and it's part okay. of the problem in recruiting. So. If I can go out there and get a hundred people responding to me for the 20 jobs that I have open on my deck, I'm going to buckshot everybody I can to my client company and they're going to hire somebody and I'm going to make that 20, 30 grand paycheck on somebody somewhere. So it's that buckshot effect. Me, I feel like what you just said, where if I've got to chase the person, how are they going to work out at that client company? And are yeah. they going to be effective? And are, are they truly interested in this job? So I'm a little different in that I will wait for my commission check for the right hire because I know two things. So number one, when I put the right body in that client company, I'm going to get more openings to do for them because they like the people. Yeah. I uh, also know that people move from company to company to company. Well, guess what? When that body that I put there leaves in two years, they're going to a different company. I've got a very good chance of landing that company because that person is there. So I build it over time. It's a smarter way anyway. You're playing the long game in that way. Uh, I want to get a question and Shaylin asked a good question. I hope I'm saying your name right, Shaylin. Uh, what kind of review process would you recommend for an organization that seems to be making the same hiring mistakes over and over again? How do we look 
at and evaluate the parts of the process that would flag this kind of outcome? It's a great question. What you do, it is a great question and I love it. And it's, it's the, you know, the, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over, expecting a different result, right? You've got to change. So tell me what it is. So you lost five salespeople in the last six months. Okay, why? Why did one, two, three, four, five leave? Why did you lose them? You've got to go back in, if it's sales specifically, into the quota system. So everybody plays this 80-20 rule, right? So 20% of the people are going to make 80% of the money for the company. Well, why is that okay? That tells me that 80% of your sales force isn't doing their job, isn't meeting quota. That's not always the sales force problem. Maybe it's a quota problem. Maybe it's the company support problem. You've got to really dive into and dig out why somebody failed, why somebody left, and go, okay, we need to change something. And, you know, the question was perfect. You can't do the same thing over and over and over and just put another body in the seat. You've got to figure out what went wrong. It's a temporary what, solution to a permanent problem, right? Absolutely. So you've got to go in, you've got to work at this. You know, recruiting has been lazy for a long time. From the job seeker side to the recruiting side, where, you know, if I get enough applications, I'll hire somebody and I'll fill, you know, I'll put a button in the seat and we'll, we'll go. And if they work out, they work out. If not, I'll replace them. To the job seeker side, where if I apply to enough jobs, somebody's going to interview me. Yeah. No, quit being lazy. Yeah. There's a, a blanketing, a blanketing of your resumes out, right? Yeah. There's all, all that craziness that used to be really popular. I mean, this was the way that people got jobs for a really long time. And I'm kind of glad to see that sort of going away to the other side. To, to your point earlier in the conversation, you found your passion and ran straight for it. Um, let me ask you this, Bob, how can people reach out to you if they want to learn more about you, your services, how you help people find the right seats? How can people find you? The easiest way to touch me is my email. That, What's your that, email? My email is bob at openxtalent.com. Bam. I'm going to put it in bob at openxtalent.com. So you guys got it. Here it is it. in the chat. So copy that. Make sure that you're reaching out to Bob if you want to learn more. Uh, bob, if you had a piece of advice to give to somebody before we sign off today, what's the best piece of advice you can give them when it comes to the recruiting game and finding the right talent? Two things. Quit being lazy and listen. It's that simple. L listen as in read, understand, look at, pay attention to, and quit being lazy and just buckshotting on both sides, recruiting and job seeking. Do your job. If you want the job, go figure out a way to get it. Quit being lazy and listen. That's great advice from a sales guy, Bob. Uh, as you guys know, I love to drop things in the chat that are useful for you. I curated a bunch of discovery questions. There are 60 plus discovery questions that you can have all to yourself right here in the chat. Uh, I'll be dropping stuff like this in the chat all the time. So feel free to grab that. Yes, this is our, this is that our t-shirt. Sell like better. It. That's right. That's right. Sell better.xyz. It's coming soon. Watch out y'all. We're swinging for the fences. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out that came to the show. As I said, this has been a long time in the making. I'm going to have these every week. We're going to feature different sellers from different industries. If you want to be on the show and you sell something way outside the box, that's unique. Reach out to me. I am impossible to miss. You can hit me at james at jbarrows.com and we will get you in so that you can be a part of the show and tell us a little bit about what you sell and how your best practices differ from ours. That's the whole name of the game. Find the stuff that works. Bob, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on the show today. You were a great first guest. I really appreciate it. This was fun. I really, really enjoyed it. I had fun. I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me be the first guest. I appreciate uh. that. Man, I, I wouldn't have had nobody else, man. This was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for coming out and learning with us today. I'm looking forward to next week. Next week, we are having a completely different guest. I'm not going to spoil it, so look out for the promos. Be sure that you sign up for it, and we'll see you guys next week when we come live with someone else to help you sell better. Thanks, Bob. I can't wait to see who's next, and I'm coming for the next one. Yeah, thanks, man. Bye, Bye everybody. Have a great day. See you guys.